Good morning, everybody. Fantastic to have you here. Fantastic community we are building here together and an absolutely amazing enterprise cloud team that we have at Hewlett Packard. We are recruiting some of the brightest minds have already done so and we keep building out and we are the most serious player in the OpenStack world, I would claim, uh, building a cloud solution and a cloud story together with you in this community. And I'm Martin Mikos, I'm the head of the business unit, the HP Cloud business unit here today. And I'll give you a quick intro and then we'll continue with Bill Hilf. So very importantly, let's start with an important thing. We want to make sure there are opportunities for women in technology and we have a, a program for you, all, all women who are, uh, have a technical degree or are taking a technical degree in college the application deadline is the 16th of November and we will announce the scholarship at the HP Discover in Barcelona in early December. When you look at what we are creating here, we see a world that is increasingly developer-led, it's open source based, and together we are building a cloud solution here. These are big changes for everybody. It's a big change for Hewlett Packard to have something that's developer led because that's not what the company was always known for. And it was a very big decision a few years ago to decide that we will build our cloud systems and our cloud solutions and our cloud products on open source components such as OpenStack and Cloud Foundry. And when you look at what's happening in the world with open source significant open source projects. They are driving the paradigm shift that we are seeing now. For the last 30 years, we've lived in the PC-based, client-server, web-based world. And we are now shifting over to the cloud world. And nearly everything we once, we old guys, learned about software and design is changing and changing upside down or changing 180 degrees. Such as the second to last bullet point I have there, that in the cloud, you design for failure. We grew up thinking and knowing that hardware was the place where you, you produced resiliency and then the applications would fail. In the cloud world, it's the opposite. The software, the application workloads that you des design will need to be designed for failure because although clouds have amazing availability and service levels, there's no formal guarantee that a particular instance or virtual machine will be up and running. It can die at any time. And we see this with Netflix where they have even created a software procedure that takes care, or not takes care of it, but that warns you of it, meaning the chaos monkey. So at Netflix, they have the chaos monkey, the purpose of which is to kill processes randomly, just to make sure that every developer is prepared for a situation where the underlying infrastructure isn't guaranteeing a certain level of, of availability. So we're seeing big, big changes in how software is uh, designed and developed and deployed. And we are moving from that classical world, the client-server based world, the, the old world, into this new world. And very few can go just to one or the other. Most of HP's customers are large organizations that have both classical workloads and modern workloads. And they're asking us to help them to go from one to the other. And you can't just abandon one. You have to keep them both running at the same time. So for enterprise, it's a transition from traditional IT into cloud. And for us as a company, as Hewlett Packard, it's very important that on the one hand, we are developing new products based on open source for our customers. On the other hand, and equally importantly, we are helping them in the transition from the classical IT to the modern IT. A new startup may not have that challenge because they start from scratch and they, they grow up in the cloud world. But most of the big compute power today lives in the old world and is transitioning to the new. There are amazing benefits with open source, and that's why open source over time beats any other method of producing software. But there are also specific challenges that we have to deal with, such as who are the architects who can say no? Brilliant software design requires somebody to say no every now and then. And if you have a software, an open source software project, you must decide on how that no decision gets made, because otherwise, you get feature bloat and you get uh, suboptimal design in your product. And you must remember to listen to customers. And I'm happy to see that the OpenStack Summit, we see more and more customers coming in, end users who give us their very direct feedback on, on the product. And then, of course, there's 
internal co-opetition. We work very closely with the other vendors in the OpenStack world, but we also compete with them when it comes to the real projects with customers. And keeping that in good balance takes special effort in an open source project. So what we stand for at Hewlett Packard is a combination of major cloud ecosystems in the world. When we have a cloud product, a service, or an offering, or a product or technology, we call it Helion. That's our brand name for the product family, Helion OpenStack, Helion Developer Platform, and so on. We draw on the OpenStack project, and that's the most important bet and the most important decision we've made to build all future products on OpenStack. We use Cloud Foundry as the, as the PaaS platform, and we draw from the design paradigms of the AWS world which affect cloud computing, whether you're a user of AWS or not, but taking advantage of all the innovation that happens there. That's what we do at HP and within the Helion product family. We take our role in the community very seriously, and of course, it's a community and we work together. So the majority of the momentum in the OpenStack community comes from the community itself. But if you allow yourself to, to take account on the contributions, you'll see that HP is the leading contributor in the Juno release. So looking at it a little bit more broadly, we, sh we have shown in the world that in the web world, OpenStack won. And the LAMP stack uh, became the dominant platform in everything that was web. And now we're doing the same in the cloud world and with open source again and all together here. Thank you, and over to Bill. Okay, hello, bonjour. <laughs> Come on, one time. All right, thank you. You're in Paris, you can say one time. Every time I say I think of a personal moment, um, I, in my French class, way back, my, I used to walk in and my French teacher would say, bonjour, Billy, and none of you get to call me Billy, by the way. <laughs> Um, and I always have this twitch of my friend, thinking about my French teacher whenever I hear the word bonjour. So, uh, good morning. My, my name is Bill Health, and I run our product management team in the Helion Group at HP. Uh, I'm going to take you through um, a few different things uh, this morning about our product strategy at, at a certain altitude. Uh, and then I'm going to lead you to some things that are going on the rest of today, tomorrow, the rest of the week that will go uh, very deep in specific areas uh, in what we're building. Um, one of the uh, things I'll start with, though, is what we hear from enterprises and what we believe at HP it takes to make OpenStack enterprise ready. And I think we say that a lot at the summits. We say that a lot in the community. Um, and I think it's worth spending some time on what that means because it's much more than the technology. Uh, and it, it is great to see a lot more users and customers uh, coming. And my, my week is full of, I measure sort of success of OpenStack by how many customer meetings I have versus vendor meetings or people trying to get acquired by HP, or get us to invest in you or something. And I, this week is stacked full of customer meetings, which is a great sign. Uh, but the reason that we spend so much time on understanding what enterprises want is because to build a successful community and to build a successful product, we have to think broadly about enterprise adoption of technology. Um, and I am going to be speaking within context of the enterprise specifically. I'm not going to be speaking about um, consumer or, or other, other domains that way. So, uh, and I also spent almost a decade at Microsoft uh, before I joined H HP, so I have lots of animations and builds in my slides. It'll make it very exciting. So, one, one of the things that HP does every single day um, is we talk to enterprises around the world. Uh, we, are, we are not trying to go into the enterprise. We are in every single enterprise account in the Fortune 500, at least if, if not beyond, in some capacity. Could be printers, could be servers, could be software, could be cloud. And so we do have a great listening system for understanding what enterprises are, are dealing with, what they're facing. Uh, and the reality is most CIOs, and you can replace the CIO with whatever title that, that you want, have a ton of things already that makes their business run. Now that may be like, duh, I understand that. A lot of people don't get that. They think about cloud as something net new that an enterprise is just going to swallow and, and take in and do something new with. They have all these different types of things, apps, data centers, people, um, they're using, typically, most of them are using some sort of SaaS, be it Salesforce or Workday or some other type of SaaS application. Um, they have existing vendor relationships. Now, although they may not like those vendor relationships, they may not like paying those vendors the licensing fees, in many cases, they're investments they've already made. 
And in some cases, there are multi-year investments that they've already made. So they, they can't just throw it all out and say, I'm going to start brand new. How do I take advantage? And I hear this literally daily talking to customers. How do I take advantage of what I have already as I build the new for the future? And then there's real constraints. Uh, there's real constraints in, in all over the world from regulatory issues, be it if you're in a regulated industry, financial services, healthcare, oil and gas, manufacturing. Uh, if you're uh, dealing with certain types of, of business policies, I talked to an, an agricultural customer of ours on Friday. They have a whole set of stuff I never knew about in the agriculture industry that are related to how they do business. Those things won't change. OpenStack, Azure, AW, that's not going to change how that industry works. So the question is really, how do these new technologies, how does cloud become part of their business? Not how do they take their business and transform it into the cloud? And this, the, the gaps that they have in skills are up and down the stack from IT to development. And then really understanding what performance looks like. And that's, that's both a technical but also a responsiveness to the business statement. How quickly can they turn around and be, uh, be faster for the business? So these are all quotes that I get from uh, talking to customers. Uh, flexibility to work with the existing, which I just told you about. This is a really great one. I, I love the way that the, the CIO told me. He said, I want to be a responsive resource while still maintaining control. And his specific language was, he wants to be an internal service provider to his, to his business, to his employees inside in the different departments inside his company. There's a very large media company that we're working with that's doing this right now. He basically wants to be a broker and present to his inside users compute and storage and networking and applications. And behind the scenes, he's going to provision whatever he needs. He might get it from his own OpenStack private cloud. He may get those resources from AWS. He may get it from Azure. He may get it from Rackspace. But he doesn't want any of his end users, his employees, or, or the departments within his enterprise to have to know what those are. He wants to be an internal broker and service provider. That's a very common theme. Uh, and the last one is the, the, the speed that the cloud market is changing. They're, most customers, particularly traditional enterprise, are, they're very nervous about going all in with one particular player or what, what lock-in or proprietary may look like in the future. So this is the, the, those, the reason I spent time on that is not just to give you high level, see I, these were the key tenets of how we design a product strategy. These were influencers to how we built what we're, we're going to take you through now with the Helion platform. And as Martin described, we have two, uh, Helion's our brand, just to, for clarification, and our, our marketing folks in here remind me of this all the time. Helion is not only OpenStack for HP, it's a, it's, a, it's a portfolio name for all the things that we do related to cloud computing. So within that, I'm going to talk about two very specific things, the Helion OpenStack distribution that we released and the Helion development platform. And we build a variety of things around these, but these are our core platform, core operating system, so to speak. And at the core um, is open source. And if you want to have a deeper dive with us on what are our principles for building commercial products um, with a, a spine of open source in, in the middle, uh, we can take you through it. We have a very clear, discrete set of principles of how we work through issues when we're dealing with open source and commercial productization. And certainly, Martin coming on board I would put on a very, very short list of people who actually know how to do that quite well, commercializing open source and understanding that dimension of dealing with both the commercial world and, and, a, and an open world. And through that, we, we take the projects, as, as, as mentioned, of OpenStack and, and Cloud Foundry. We work upstream. You saw the different videos of people, a lot of people in this room who are contributing um, upstream in both of those. Um, and then we do a, a set of things that this is sort of unique in, in, some, in some ways where we we believe actually that's important that these things can be better together. That if someone's choosing an open source cloud, if that decision of um, if open source, then I'm looking at OpenStack, uh, if they're making an open decision, that we believe op Cloud Foundry and OpenStack can be better together. So some of the things that we do, um, and there's going to be some great sessions later, and so I'll give you the session numbers and all that, are making sure that we can illuminate some of the power of OpenStack through the development platform. In this particular case, in our application lifecycle service, we, we present the, the, what's, what's powered by Trove underneath, the ability to have a managed database uh, a service within that application lifecycle. So there's apps that are built in, in, inside Cloud Foundry, which is our runtime inside our development platform, the ability to take advantage of a managed database service. You'll see us doing more and more of things like this, where we take the power of OpenStack and light it up uh, through the development environment. And what's 
what's really critical to our strategy, I'm going to take you through a bunch of slides, slides here about choice. And before I go down this path, though, I want to make something really clear. Um, choice is something you don't get accidentally in a product. It has to be engineered. You have to design for choice. You have to intentionally make your applications and your software work in a certain way and go and test and certify and, and go through all the benchmarks for some different programs that exist out there to make things work the right way. So a lot of our, our, our engineering work in, in the platform that we do is making sure that we provide that right level of choice. Why? Not because we want to just be altruistic and say choice is wonderful, let's all you know, put flowers on our hair and sing bonjour all day long. That's not why at all. It's because of those things I showed earlier. The requirements of, of, of the enterprise customer, that flexibility that they need for OpenStack and our platform of Helion to work in their environment requires that we have a platform that gives them degrees of choice all throughout the logical architecture. The first one I'll talk about is hardware, where we obviously we, uh, we we're going to make OpenStack work great with HP gear, server storage and networking, uh, but we also support today Dell and IBM servers. If you want the specific model numbers, I can give them to you. And then very soon we'll be providing sort of a third party harness, test harness that if any OEM wants to build uh, or to certify against our platform. Um, similarly with uh, hypervisors, uh, support of KVM and ESX today, Hyper-V in, in, uh, will support early next year, um, but we think it's really important as people start taking that next step beyond basic virtualization enterprise that they have a broad range of support at the hypervisor layer. Uh, one of the things that it's really particularly important, um, I spent a lot of time at, at Microsoft in the server businesses there, um, the hypervisor control point is really important for a lot of vendors. And it's really important that enterprises understand what that control point does. And similar to other parts of the, of the architecture as well. We do believe that to be open, it's not just being open in the core of OpenStack. You need to have a pluggable model that allows an enterprise to make those types of choices. I haven't talked to a single enterprise, I've been talking to enterprises for 20 years, that is all in on one vendor. Most enterprises say this to me, I have one of everything, Bill. I'm an Oracle customer, an SAP customer, a Microsoft customer, I'm a Google customer, I'm a Red Hat customer, I'm an HP customer, I have one of everything you've ever created in your crazy vendor world. We have it all, and we have stuff we don't even know how it runs anymore. So the, the ability to, su to support that degree of heterogeneity is really important. Same goes for uh, languages, I think I skipped one. Maybe not. Um, and this is mostly a statement about our development platform and its ability to provide the support for different frameworks, different programming languages. We'll have .NET support in that. And uh, I got Omri sitting in the front row. I'll just say early 2015, first half. Um, nothing like getting engineering commitments live in front of an audience of all your peers. Um, I should do more of this. What else can we get commitments on right now? Um, uh, but similarly with, with languages and frameworks, uh, management tools, so we have a product at HP called Cloud Service Automation, or, or it's abbreviated CSA sometimes. Um, it's the tool that we, we uh, sell frequently for what I'll call a private cloud in a box for very traditional enterprises that are looking for a turnkey solution, but also supporting the OpenStack tools like Heat and, and, and Triple O and support early next year of Ansible for, we have a lot of customers that are interested in sort of the agent list, uh, config tools from bare metal on up, and so we think Ansible has some interesting uh, capabilities that we'll be supporting there soon as well. Uh, storage, uh, always a, a great uh, subject of debate at our summits um, to talk about storage. Uh, we believe that choice of storage is, is equally important uh, for customers and we're hearing that loud and clear from them. Uh, be it on, you know, you, with different types of backends, we have, if you're not familiar with store virtual VSA or three-part store serve, these are, are from, a, these are HP uh, enterprise block storage solutions. Um, supporting Ceph and Swift, uh, and, and, and very importantly, understanding network virtualization. Uh, and this is an area, just looking at the sessions this week, um, there's going to be a lot of debate and, and, uh, and discussion around, uh, around this, I'm sure. Um, we fundamentally believe that uh, Neutron is the core orchestrator, arbiter of, of what should be multiple, multiple backends, multiple SDN solutions. Uh, we have lots of different customers with very different use cases that we deal with in from traditional enterprise to telcos and service providers, and the needs there do vary. So we support today uh, 
the HP SDN controller called VCN. Um, very shortly, we'll support VMware NSX, uh, Nuage, Open Daylight over time. Um, but we do believe choice here is equally important. Uh, and, and when we talk to the concerns that enterprises have and CIOs about that lock-in, when they say, I'm concerned about where I'm going to get lock-in, the reason I'm flipping through all these different parts of the architecture, this is the questions that we get. Where will it be, Bill? Where will that lock-in happen? Is it going to be in the SDN layer? Is it the hypervisor layer? Is it the host or guest OS layer? So the, the, the sensitivities of the enterprise customer right now are very high around the subject. So of course, as uh, we will go um, and build solutions from HP that bring together a, a set of things in an integrated way. So this is an example of where we take uh, the tool I mentioned at the top, a cloud service automation for a management uh, point of view, storage solutions, networking solutions, and servers, and we build a product out of that called Cloud System. Um, this is something we sell today. It's actually our largest selling product that we have today. Um, and it's an integrated hardware software solution for, uh, for private clouds. The reason we sell so much of this, th we don't sell this to, um, let's say, you mentioned Netflix earlier and, and chaos. We, we don't sell this to, you know, CERN and get the guys doing the Large Hadron Collider work. We sell this to really bread and butter enterprises. So actually most of them are pretty darn boring. They're not exciting brand names that you read about in the press every day. Um, some of them make like, you know, corn. It's just not that exciting, right? I mean, you can't, can't romance corn that much. Um, and so these are, these are Clorox. These are companies that are very, very traditional enterprises that just basically got through the virtualization stage in the past couple of years. And so what they're looking for is not the extreme stateless applications, hundreds of thousands of nodes, incredible high performance computing scenario. They're looking for probably 100, 200 nodes, some self-service web-based portals, uh, and just faster access to their end users for what was classically taken IT to you know, weeks or months to do. That, I mean, that, those are the use cases that we, we see a lot for this. We sell a lot of these every day. And then we layer into that different types of security services that people want, encryption at rest or, or, or over the wire. We have different operational tools that we bring into it as well. So a lot of people say, what, you know, fundamentally, what is the, the, the tenets of the strategy? And I think Martin already hit on quite a few of these. Um, the first is open source is at, is at the heart of our strategy. And, and I'll say even beyond that, open is at the heart of our strategy, making sure not just open source, but the ability to have a flexible system. Um, that is, the word I like to use a lot is something that is very composable, that an enterprise can take and build something specific to their needs. Um, Personally, uh, this is the reason I came to HP. This is why I left a pretty nice job as the GM of, of product management for Windows Azure, because I had spent years talking to customers at my former job and hearing again and again, I'm not going to put all my stuff in your box. I don't care where your box is at. You have to fit to my needs. And so the design and the composability of this is crucial to what we're doing, because we believe that cloud won't be a standalone solution that enterprises have in the future. It will look like, just like IT. There's not only one way to do it. And lastly, the, the, the control that um, IT has, and I, I say this.